Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Ji Xiaojun in Beijing. In the year 221 BC, Qin Shi Huang unified China and became China's first emperor. By the time of the reign of the Han Emperor Wu Di, 100 years later, a multi-ethnic society had been built up, dominated by the Han ethnic group. Han culture provided a solid foundation on which China could establish its reputation in the ancient world as a powerful nation that was politically and culturally advanced. And inside the united country, the various ethnic groups were free to give expression to their creativity. A fruit of this ethnic harmony was Qin Han culture, the achievements of which have been a source of East Asian pride ever since. When Qin Shi Huang unified China in the year 221 BC, he became China's first emperor. By the time of the Han Dynasty Emperor Wu Di, who reigned from 141 BC to 86 BC, a multi-ethnic nation dominated by the Han ethnic group was firmly established. The main currents of Han culture had taken their basic shape, and China was becoming known throughout the world as a powerful nation that was politically and culturally advanced. Within this great united country, all ethnic groups were able to give full expression to their creativity, and together they created Qin Han culture, the accomplishments of which have been a source of East Asian pride ever since. In the winter of the year 198 BC, a Han princess was married off to a chief of the Xiongnu, one of the northern tribes. It was a gesture intended to improve diplomatic relations, and it was a diplomatic move that bought China time to recover. During their combined period of 40 years of reign, Han emperors Wen Di and Jing Di followed a policy of reducing both taxes and compulsory labor. As a result, the people were able to recuperate from the years of turmoil, and the country began to become rich and powerful. At a place called Yang Ling, one can visit the mausoleum of Emperor Jing Di, who was revered in history as a good emperor. He was certainly one of the most frugal of the Han emperors, even though a substantial quantity of riches was buried with him in his tomb. Many Han Dynasty imperial mausoleums are surrounded by secondary burial pits. In fact, there are no less than 157 of them in the 10 square kilometers that make up the Han imperial burial grounds. When archaeologists began excavating and cataloging some of the secondary burial pits at Yangling in the 1990s, they found the results astonishing. Artifacts representing all aspects of the emperor's material life had been buried here, food, chariots and horses, draft animals, pigs, dogs, cattle and sheep, statues of slaves, male and female, and various soldiers. All of this makes it clear that the emperors led affluent lifestyles. The numerous male and female statues perhaps represent the people who guarded and served the emperor during his lifetime. When they were buried, they would have been dressed in silk garments or leather armor. Even though the clothing is mostly decomposed, it isn't difficult to imagine how magnificent they would have been.
The clothing and accessories of Han women were stylish, free-flowing, and natural-looking. From the statues, it seems that noble women of the Han dynasty carried themselves with a tranquil bearing, but radiated an inner happiness. It has been well noted that the terracotta warriors of the Qin dynasty have countenances that are utterly expressionless and very serious. These Han statues, on the other hand, all have relaxed expressions, suggesting that their lives were satisfying. in ancient times, horses played as important a role in war as tanks do today. Emperor Wen established a horse breeding program, and by the end of the reign of Emperor Jing Di, it was enormously successful. By that time, there were 36 horse breeding ranches with 300,000 war horses spread over northwest China. The Han court finally had a powerful cavalry, and it was an important weapon in Emperor Wu Di's proactive defense strategy. Emperor Wu Di sought the finest breeds of horses in China's northwest on two occasions. He found one suitable breed from the area around Dunhuang, while the second breed, known as blood-sweating horses, was acquired by a general who went on an expedition to present-day Uzbekistan. The emperor was so happy with these breeds that he wrote a poem in praise of them. From that time on, the phrase, heavenly horses from the west, became a kind of slogan that epitomized the bold spirit that expanded the empire westward. On the central plains near Chang'an, along a 50-kilometer line east to west, are 11 tombs of Western Han emperors. The largest of these is that of Emperor Wu Di at Maoling, and in terms of size, it is second only to the tomb of Qin Shi Huang. These tombs, which look like hills jutting out from the flat plains, have given silent testament to the magnificence of the Western Han Dynasty for 2,000 years. Around a century into the Han Dynasty, the agricultural economy in the Yellow River Valley was being seriously disrupted by military incursions carried out by nomadic tribes from the north. Well, the imperial court decided that the country was now powerful enough to do something about strengthening stability within its borders. After Emperor Wu Di ascended the throne in the year 140 BC, he carried on the policies of Emperors Wen Di and Jing Di that had made the country strong and prosperous. And from the very start, he was unwilling to tolerate being at the head of a government that was weak and passive in the face of attack. Liu Bang, who had been the first emperor of the Han Dynasty, had carried forward the imperial system created by Qin Shi Huang, and Emperor Wu Di further strengthened and improved it, and made the empire a mighty power. Over time, a number of exceptional warriors emerged. In the year 119 BC, Emperor Wu Di ordered generals Wei Qing and Huo Qubian to lead an expedition to defeat the nomadic tribes in the north. Thus, the threat they had posed for so long would be eliminated. The armies followed separate routes north and to present-day Mongolia. After winning a decisive victory, General Huo pursued the remnants of the defeated army to the shores of Lake Baikal.
Although China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, had unified the nation, it wasn't until the reign of Han Emperor Wu Di that the country was firmly consolidated. After the victory against the nomadic tribes, the tribes were divided into two. The southern group became reconciled with the Han government and lived in harmony with China for many years. The Han government also created two prefectures in the northwest, Shuofeng and Wuyuan. Many buildings in Chang'an at that time had roof tiles inscribed with phrases such as Thousand Year Reign and Worldwide Han Rule. Everywhere, slogans could be seen expressing the high spirits of the nation. What was called the Western Territories during the Han Dynasty basically encompasses present-day Xinjiang. There were 36 nations within the territory, with populations ranging from 600 to 80,000. In the year 139 BC, Zhang Qian embarked on a diplomatic mission to the western regions, and he only returned to Chang'an after 13 years of hardship. In his report to Emperor Wu Di, Zhang urged him to establish trade contacts with the nations there and to ensure the security of the east-west transport route. The emperor accepted Zhang's suggestion, and the Silk Road was incorporated into China's economic and security strategy. He was 